about. And so they go into the promised land, but one of the things that Joshua and Caleb have a problem with the people around is that the people are complaining about how they're not who? Moses. Moses. They're complaining that they're not, you know, Moses would have done it this way, you know, and Moses would have done it this way, and why aren't you doing this, that, and the other thing like Moses? And so what did, what did Joshua and Caleb finally have to tell the people? Like, look, Moses is dead. Right? Moses is dead. He's dead, right? Will there be another Dr. Martin Luther King? No. No. Will there be another Mother Teresa? No. No. Will there be another you? No. No. The charge for change, we cannot wait for someone else to do the change that is now our responsibility. And so one of the things that Dr. King is saying in this is that the responsibility for the next level of civil rights is no longer in my hands, it is now in your hands. And so when we talk about cultural competence, it is not something that we're waiting to, you know, come from on high, you know, get these two, you know, cement tablets, and now we got it. It's all stuff that we have to figure out together. All right? So that's, um, so we'll go Well, and the ideas that. are what carry on. It's not, they didn't need Moses. They just needed the ideas. They didn't, it was all about the idea of leaving the idea. They yep. just needed to do it. And ideas never die. Ideas never die. Um, People always want to leave her. You know? mm -hmm. Because what, what does that do to them in terms of responsibility? It takes it away. Yeah. It takes away responsibility. I'll do it, otherwise I don't want to. Right? So I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be in charge of stuff if, um, if I don't have to. So one of the things I'd like for us to, to focus on is the truth about human beings. First of all, um, human beings can learn, change, and grow. Right? So we can adapt to the environments that we come in, the, the family systems that we've been born in. Um, don't have to limit who we are, but we can grow beyond that or incorporate that into, uh, into our lives. People do what they think works even when what? Even when it doesn't. Even when it doesn't work. Right? But they do it because they think it works. Um, all behavior is goal-directed. Why do people do things? Because they think what? It's going to get them to their goal. It's going to get them what they want, right? And lastly, an attitude is a reaction to a goal. What have you been taught about what an attitude is? What is an attitude? The way you think about something. The way you think about something? Attitude. What's an attitude? Mm -hmm. It has a negative connotation. It has a negative connotation. Oh, no, not necessarily. It's it stronger than an emotion. It can. It's stronger than an emotion? It's more, more of an entrenched emotion. Okay, more of an entrenched emotion. Doesn't it have like some kind of enmeshed with behavior? Like your attitude kind of reflects your behavior, your behavior reflects your attitude. Okay, so there's, a, there's this of, balance between your behavior and your attitude, and they reflect each other. Yeah, I, I think for me, I will look at it like that. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll give you, and I agree with everything that you're saying, I'll give you um, a thing, something to add to your, your definition or your, your concept of attitude, right? So my dad was uh, my pastor, and on Sunday, we would go to church from 7.30 a.m. to 11.30 p.m. We'd stop at 3 o'clock for chicken, not because we're black, but because chicken is delicious, right? Got it. So church on Sunday all day. Friday night, I asked my dad for the car, and because my dad loves me, what does he say? Sure. Yeah, he says, hey, hey, take the keys, right? So I, I take the keys, I hang out with my friends, uh, I fill the car up with gasoline, I come home before curfew, and my dad says, I have what kind of an attitude? Good. A good attitude or a positive attitude, right? So Sunday comes, my best friend Dexter calls me at noon and says, Andre, can you pick me up for the movies at noon? What do I know about Sunday? He can't. It's right? all day. It's all day church, right? But Jesus is my friend, so, you know, I, I can call on him. He'll answer prayers, right? So I go up to my dad and say, Dad, can I borrow the car? And what does my dad say? No. Not only does he say no, but he gives me a lecture about how I'm leading people to hell, right? <laughs> because every negative consequence in my family, the ultimate consequence is that you are going to hell. Right? And so I say my dad has what kind of an attitude? Bad attitude. 
a bad attitude. And what does he say about my attitude? You know, bad attitude. That I have a bad you attitude. Need an adjustment. Right? And I need to adjust my attitude. Yeah, adjust, right? Attitude adjustment. I need an attitude adjustment. <laughs> what is it that actually determines one's attitude? Actions and feelings together. Actions and feelings together? Reaction to a situation. Reaction to a situation. Your inner dialogue. Your inner dialogue. I will tell you that it's much simpler <laughs> than what we're, what we are, uh, what we typically try to describe it as, right? I, I will say that the, the answer is much more simple. Um, how many people have been around teenagers? Raise your hand. How many people have been a teenager? Raise your hand. <laughs> right? Now, what happens when, um, when a teenager is denied access to something that they want? They go sideways to get it. They go sideways to get it. They what? Rebel. They rebel, right? Um, I would say that they typically would have a bad attitude, right? Uh, my grandmother would call it a funky attitude, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, that same teenager, and it can almost be even seconds later, they make a request, and they are granted that request, what kind of attitude or what kind of behavior follows the granting of their request? Shift. They typically are happy. There's a shift, right? One might say that there is a good attitude. So now, seconds earlier, the same teenager had a bad attitude. So what is it that's actually determining their attitude? If you're fulfilling my goal. If you achieve your goal. When you achieve your goal, you have a good attitude, when you don't achieve your goal, you have a bad attitude, right? So, if you encounter, you're a practitioner, you encounter someone with a bad attitude, what do you know about them for sure? They're not getting what they want. They're not getting what they want. And so then, as a, as a practitioner, two things kick in for us. Either, um, what's the simplest way to get them to a good attitude? Give them what they want. Give them what they want. Right? Help them get what they want. What if what they want is not something that you can handle, it's not something you can do, they don't have the resources to support it, it's just not possible. Then what becomes your responsibility? Advocate. To help be an advocate? Change their, change their goal. That I change their goal. Or help, help them, them, them redefine their goal. their goal. I help them redefine their own goal, right? And so as a helper, when I, when I understand this thing about an attitude, then that helps me to be able to interact with people from different parts of the world more effectively, right? So whether I know, you know, Sudanese or not, if I understand that a person has a negative attitude, what do I know about them? They have an unfulfilled goal. They have an unfulfilled goal. And so to... to um, to be most helpful, I have to, A, be able to figure out their goal and then help them direct their energy and their attention to that goal accomplishment, right? right. All right. Unless it's an, in a destructive goal. And I... So like, like drinking is your goal, getting drunk is your goal and that makes you happy. Well, yeah, I mean, what if it's a destructive goal? So, so let's go, let's talk about goals. Right? So let's talk about goals. Because even if it's a destructive goal, and, and this is not popular, I'm not saying you have to support it, but you can't stop someone if they have a destructive goal. All right? So, we'll, and we'll flip that around in just a second. I wanted to get your, your hand. Well, basically, the same mind what she was saying, that if the goal is not going to be conducive or productive to the person at all, like, should we still try to get it for them? So, like, if the person's an alcoholic, and the only thing that can them long is to get a drink. <laughs> and I, I am going to say, as practitioners, we don't ever, we're not able to get people's goals. Right. Our, our job is to direct them and how to get their own goals. Right? Now, there are certainly ways that we would prefer that people behave and act and think, but we cannot legislate how people act, think. Um, there are some things around behavior, but we'll talk about that in, in just a bit, all right? So I, I do want to get to, because your point is very valid, I want to get to this, this concept of what 
what the goal is. And what I would submit to you is that the, what Adler says are humans' goals is that everyone is looking for significance, belonging, and safety. And that when we have um, bad behaviors like um, addictions or, um, or uh, risk behaviors, that one of these things is probably lacking or that the person perceives that one of these things is lacking. And so when we, when we talk about uh, destructive behaviors at, or, or getting to those goals through destructive behaviors, I would argue that they have faulty goals because it's not getting these three things or they think that the method of getting one of these three things is effective. But we go back to our, our previous slide that people do, they do what they think works. Right. So drinking, having sex, um, you know, having other gambling, risky behavior, I think is going to give me this. And so I engage in behaviors that I think are going to give me this, even when they what? Don't, don't work. Even when they don't work. All right? And so, um, so how, do we, how do we engage people to analyze their behaviors that they think are working toward in connection with the ultimate goals? And part of that is we spit in their soup, right? We, have you heard that expression? Yeah. So we, we create cognitive dissonance. We ask them to do something. We ask them to demonstrate their, how, how their current behavior is lining up with their ultimate goals. All right? Does that make sense mm -hmm. at all? Okay. So if we think it's a destructive behavior, ask them how is it how is it working in their life, or, or what? It, how do those goals provide significance, belonging, and safety? Yeah, and, and what 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 is what is the goal of your behavior? So, like um, when I taught high school, I. I work with some of my students who, who had gotten in trouble and, and that kind of stuff, and I sit down with them, and I, I'd ask them, did this behavior that you engage, well, engage in get you what you wanted? And they would be puzzled by that. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, what do you mean, did it get me what? You did this behavior because you had something in mind. Did you get what you wanted? And if their answer is yes, guess what my answer was? What'd you get? Great. You, you set a goal, you know, to, uh, to get put out of school. You got put out of school. That is great. You achieved it. Right. You achieved your goal. Great. Is this goal getting you right. to the next step? Go ahead, sir. But if the goal, they have their, their, their perception of the goal, what they want, but the consequences of getting there, they haven't really taken into consideration. Like getting expelled is something they never thought it was going to happen, but yet they still haven't achieved their goal. Right. So is it like a two-edged sword where, you know, I want my goal, but I'm going to get something 